Okay, good afternoon. Or very close to the. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to talk quiet. And like I said. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, like I said in the introduction, I'm, I'm uh, Bart from Fluxo. Um, I um, started Fluxo about uh, I think in 2007, the end of 2007. Um, do I have to speak up? Yeah. Okay. So I started uh, Fluxo in 2007. Uh, it went through several iterations, uh, and by now it's um, um, it's a CE certified uh, device, uh, which already uh, mentioned in the introduction uh, can monitor your electricity consumption, uh, gas, water, etc. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is um, going off on a tangent uh, and see what we what else we can do with the with the Fluxo. Uh, and for that, I would like to introduce the uh, Fluxo Cube. Um, it's something I've been working on. It's very experimental, so it's uh, it's only like a month old. Um, um, it's this kind of thing. Um, I think it should stick sticks to metal like that. Um, and so, for a close-up, this is the Fluxo Cube. Um, it's an experiment um, in trying. Well, what you see in, in most uh, most nodes is that, um, um, especially in open source, we take a, a microcontroller, an AVR, an ARM, etc. We, we we attach an, uh, a radio to it, and then we have the basic board, and there are some ports uh, to which you can hook up different sensors, um, which is great. Um, except that if you want to put this in your uh, living room and it's full of wires, etc., and then um, this won't pass the wife acceptance factor, so uh, um, that's one thing. And uh, secondly, uh, well, the chances are that it's not going to last very long because a, a wire gets pulled out, etc. So I wanted to, uh, in this experiment, I wanted to start saying, okay, so how can this thing look? How can make it fully open source? How we can make the uh, enclosure uh, 3D uh, printable? And uh, this is the first. Uh, let's say iteration. So this is really version one. Um, the enclosure was printed at the Fab Lab in Leuven uh, on Friday, so uh, it, j it just had enough time to cool down and uh, and, uh, and present it over here. So if you open it, it's actually uh, two boards. Um, just uh, okay. I'm going to try to coordinate this. So there's a there's a magnet as you can see there uh, there's a ring magnet a neodymium magnet uh, in the back, which does uh, two functions so you can hook it up to anything that's metal, uh, and secondly um, there's a battery at the back over here so it's a, a fat uh, lithium uh, coin cell battery, uh, 1,000 milliamp hours um, which also response is also magnetic uh, response to the magnet so that means that if you if you position it over here it gets snapped back and it will retain there so if you if I put it in there back and you hold it upside down it won't it won't release um, so for that I put a, a little hole in the back so you can push it out um, but this means that uh, yeah you can you can just mount it anywhere in your in your living room etc uh, and it will it will stay put um, now for the node itself, uh, well, perhaps a bit uh, first about the enclosure. Um, the enclosure was designed in uh, OpenSCAD, which is uh, a great tool for uh, making these kinds of things. So it's it's basically programming, um, and you program your enclosure, and you can also make all kinds of uh, everything. You can you can make it a parameter, so you can say. Here, for example, you have the, it's a bit it's a bit small, but you can say the magnet dimensions, and I have to have this kind of tolerance, etc. Um, you can see the file is just a, a bit longer, so it's like a page and a half. And if you render it, you get you get this enclosure. Yeah? And then if you press the print button, you can actually uh, 3D print it. So uh, um, that's something I would like to do as well. So not only make a sensor node, but also have have this thing uh, evolve. Uh, it's it's code, so. Uh, if somebody wants to take it and say, okay, I can make this a lot fancier, uh, feel free to do so. Um, I haven't put it up on, on GitHub yet, but uh, it will be soon, so this is uh, still very fresh. Ouch. Um, then a bit about the internal, so... 
So if you take the top board, so one of it functions as, as, a, as the, uh, the external part. So if you look at it this way. Uh, so on the outside, uh, we, uh, we intend to mount the appearance sensor so for movement detection and an ambient light sensor. So they have to be on the outside. But the other ones, we can just keep them on the inside. So there's a temp and humidity sensor, uh, a pressure sensor, and for now also an, uh, an accelerometer, uh, which is a lot of are a lot of fun sensors that you can do uh, uh, interesting thing with, uh, things with. Um, for a microcontroller, so the fluxometer internally has been using uh, AVR for a while, but uh, well, it's been a couple of years and, uh, and now we have all those sexy uh, Cortex uh, M series uh, stuff. Uh, the one I, I mounted over here was an, is an LPC device. Uh, it's been out for, I think, half a year, a year or something. Um, the great fun thing about this is that um, it internally comes with a switch, which means that you can uh, switch all, it's a crossbar, so you can assign functions UART, SPI, I squared C to any kind of pins. Uh, and what I'm doing is left and right exposing, that's why you see all the, the, the strange zigzag uh, traces exposing all those pins. So if you make a daughter board, you can just in software um, make certain connections by software in, in the crossbar internally in the, in the microcontroller, and you can sign uh, a little can almost reassign any pin from GPIO to I, I squared C to UART, etc. There are co a couple of, uh, of course, um, fixed pins, uh, for example, for the, uh, for the oscillator, etc. So you can't move those around uh, to, to any pin, but uh, most of them are, are uh, freely available. Um, most sensors are also I squared C, so it's actually just a bus, and you just hook up everything via I squared C. Um, so, um, I also wanted to have some uh, a, a good bit of debugging, so what I made is a third board. So the second board is actually the the radio internally, and on the back you have the battery uh, and the antenna, and then you have the third board, which is actually a debugging board. And uh, if I get the right headers, which are still in the mail, um, you can just put them in between the two other boards like a sandwich, um, and uh, you can do introspection with that board into your microcontroller. Uh, first of all, you can do ISP, so you can program it. Uh, you can also take traces, live traces from from your uh, from your application, and it's also got a, a JTAG and a serial wire uh, output, a serial wire debug output, uh, which comes standard on all uh, Cortex uh, M series chips, which means you can do some uh, very nice uh, debugging, uh, setting breakpoints, etc. Uh, I haven't tested it yet, so the the firmware upload works. Um, but uh, the JTAG still has to be tested, but I don't expect too many uh, difficulties, over, difficulties over there. So that's that. Uh, then back to the fluxometer. Um, so this is the latest version. It's, it's the B version. And it's, it's got actually a new, uh, new sensor board with a radio that is compatible uh, with the one on the sensor board. So we can actually uh, have some communication between the two. And hence the title of the, of the talk. Um, so we can actually have this fluxometer besides having it uh, measure Electricity, gas, and water consumption also have it as a as a as a hub, uh, a telemetry hub for uh, these kinds of nodes. Um, the protocol that has been supported up until now is just in the driver, so there's no application level stuff on it. But it's uh, it's uh, Gnode uh, compatible, which uh, some of you might um, be familiar with, um, and that is intended. It's intended to stay that way as well. Um, so this is the fluxometer. Um, so besides doing uh, this hardware stuff, there's a, a ton of software still to be written, um, which is uh, something I'm currently working on. So basically what I would like is that if you have such a sensor node, you have a pairing, which means that you can put the fluxometer in pairing mode and it will start listening on a special or a dedicated channel. And then if you just restart your, uh, uh, your, your cube, it will go into pairing mode and it will do auto-provisioning of all the sensors that are on your cube and just uh, provision those. Uh, we need to have, uh, so that this is uh, relegated to a dedicated bootloader inside the, the Cortex, or inside the cube. And then you have uh, support for over-the-air firmware upgrades. Um, we don't have the self-descriptive uh, packets, but uh, we want to have a, a JSON format that describes what's actually uh, being sent by a specific uh, sensor node. And once we have that, we can make a, a cube daemon that can do uh, automatic uh, decoding and encoding based on that uh, JSON format. Um, 
and then since we want to have it uh, Internet of Things style, uh, we're already uh, or we intend to publish it on an, uh, on an embedded MQTT broker, which is uh, which has been present in the last uh, firmware upgrade for the for the fluxometer. So that's already in there. It's a Mosquito, um, which is an MQTT broker, uh, which uh, is going through a, a standardization process uh, right now inside uh, PAHO, if I'm not mistaken, so the Eclipse uh, Foundation. Um, so that's. Uh, uh, how the FLM could work as, an, uh, as a telemetry hub. Um, and this is some uh, doing it in action, so I just stuck it to my fridge. Um, so this would be nice, except that I'm a bit worried that my kids will take this and start playing with it. So that's, uh, that's going to be the whole, uh, the whole purpose. Um, then again, I could fully, I could put uh, like, a, like a dozen it on, on, on the fridge and just hope that they won't uh, at least keep one of them uh, or don't touch at least one of them. But um, so that's a bit uh, the idea of the of the cube. So it's very much still uh, a work in progress. Um, this is a really basic and, uh, an alpha version, um, but I hope it will uh, it will evolve in, into to something nice. So um, yeah. So if you feel feel free to uh, to participate if you've got questions, uh, well, you know where to find me, um, and uh, I'll be posting this uh, the current firmware and the ASCAT software. Or the, the SCAT uh, description of uh, of the enclosure uh, will be posted uh, to the cube to a cube repository very uh, very soon. So I expect this week or next week uh, will be posted. So that's about it. <laughs> Questions? Uh, do you have any idea what a rough estimate on the lifetime of the node? From the battery perspective, Sandy, um, not yet, but it should be plus one year, and that that's should be a conservative uh, conservative uh, estimate. It all depends, of course. Uh, it's not really the sensors that will do a lot of uh, the battery consumption, but actually the radio. So if you say, okay, I want to have updates every ten seconds, then it won't last for a year. If you say five minutes. Which is okay for for a temperature reading or a pressure reading, etc. Um, then you should at least get one year. That's that's the aim, at least. Yeah. So, um, so we'll see. Uh, it depends how 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 good we can write the software. Uh, it also means that you have to do a lot of uh, well, not a lot, but you you have to start out with an architecture that that does well that puts the the microcontrol into a, a deep sleep mode uh, by default and only wake it up. So that that's something that's been taken care of already. It has to be validated, of course, into the into the design. So most of these sensors or the, the, the relevant ones that need uh, that need to be able to wake up the microcontroller, like the PIRS, the movement detection, they're already hooked up to the one pin that can take it out of a deep sleep mode. And if you put this cortex into a deep sleep mode, you you get about uh, like a one micro amp of consumption. Um, so it's it won't be the the, the arm that that's doing the consumption. Uh, uh, but we'll see. And the radio is also 0 0.1 microamp if you put it into sleep. Of course, if you wake it up and you start transmitting, it's it's like 20 milliamps. Uh, and that's also the reason, one of the reasons we uh, we use the, uh, the 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 Gnode stuff because it's um, well the protocol is really very tiny. Uh, if you go into these tiny kinds of uh, low power stuff, every bit that you send is costing you dearly. So every bit that you can spare and not send is is uh, it's giving you battery life, so that's uh, and you you make trade off so of course. Uh, um, the maximum packet size will be about 64 bytes. Uh, the header is only three bytes, and you put a bit of preamble there, so you're only sending a couple of bytes every uh, for every packet that you're sending. Um, but it remains to be seen how far we can how far we can take it. Could you maybe tell us a bit about? Uh uh, the radio, uh, what kind of uh, frequency it uses, or what kind of protocol, and also does it integrate with other home automating systems like X10 or other protocols? Well, the radio will be an, uh, an evolved version of the of the one that's uh, being used by Gnode, um, so the rfm 12 b which is pretty popular in in, uh, in hacker circles. Um, so it's pretty low cost. Uh, it, it, uh, it's on 868. Uh, it's frequency shift keying. Uh, with the new uh, version of that radio, uh, you can do some de-whitening and, and stuff like that, or uh, Gaussian uh, FSK. 
but we'll probably just put it in FSK and, and, and maintain as much uh, compatibility as uh, with, with the current uh, uh, Gnode configuration. So not, not too much uh, fancy stuff in there, um, but it gets the job done, uh, which is okay. Um, and then for compatibility, yeah, well, you have a plethora of, uh, of standards these days. You have Zigbee and uh, Z-Wave and stuff like that. So um, what I also like about, about uh, the, the GLab stuff is that it's fully open. Uh, you don't have to go to a special interest group, uh, sign an NDA and blah, 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 before you get, before you get the spec. So it's fully open. You write your own driver and you, it's just SPI based and you say put it in this mode and I'll send it out in this way. Uh, which I find great. So if you want to make an open device, that's the way to do it. Um, compatibility, well, you can always, once you have it in MQTT, you can just, uh, um, it will be in uh, JSON on top of MQTT so you can parse it any way you like. Um, if we um, one day make a, make a version of this where you can do uh, control, then it's just in MQTT that you send on a special on a certain topic, saying okay, put this on, put this off, and everything else is software. If you want to hook it up to to extend to something else, then yeah, you have to put in a bridge or a, uh, it's pure software. Yeah. Okay, my question was because you advertised it as a tool for measuring water, gas, and electricity consumption. I don't see how these sensors can measure water, gas, and electricity consumption. So this one already measures, uh, this is like a, this is a Dutch smart meter. So you can also already hook it up directly to Dutch smart meter and it will decode the, the, the P1 port of the Dutch smart meter. There are also on the other part, on the top there, on the screw thermal, you can connect current clamps, you can then connect read contacts, uh, there are some more sensors in, in the pipeline, like an optoreflective sensor, that's almost finished. And so with the fluxometer, we already do that. And now the question is, how can you extend it? So if you want to measure temperature, okay, well, this fluxometer is most of the time sitting in a basement, so you can measure the temperature of your basement or run a very long wire. But if we can just extend it, so if you see here, there's a radio module over there, a radio module with an antenna. And then if you have this cube and you put it in your living room, then it can just uh, talk to the to the fluxometer and this one can already just connect it make these readings available uh, and, and 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 then yeah off you go to the internet so that's the whole chain is there a plan for uh, other uh, sensor boards like if you want to connect external sensors like to put them in your fridge or so uh, what do you mean putting in your fridge uh? If you want the internal uh, temperature, I'm not sure if you want to really stick the whole cube in, in the fridge. <laughs> well, it would be a nice experiment. It would be a, a solution to my kids uh, tampering with, uh, with the setup. Um, but um, wait, uh, so this is actually what you're seeing is version one. Um, version, um, or no, no, revision one. Revision two will already have some holes here um, for extending the, the I squared C bus. So for, for uh, having a better uh, hackability. So you can leave it open. That means that it will have some open holes for the temperature sensor, but you can also close it and have an external I squared C sensing. So uh, the range will be limited. So it's uh, a meter, two meters, perhaps in the best case 10, if you perhaps lower the, the clock rate of the, the I squared C bus. Uh, but it's, uh, that's one way where you could easily extend the, the cube. Um, if you want to add even different sensors, um, there's always, of course, a way to open the sandwich and put put another board in between and then you can extend it with even uh, more exotic uh, stuff. But the basic idea is, to, okay, you take this cube and you already have the five, five, six sensors for free. You don't have to start extending the board and you have a small a small uh, sensor node, but if you want all the sensors then you get a board like this and then you have to think, okay, how am I going to put this in an enclosure? Uh, you don't know and then, okay, then, then it's just over there uh, gathering dust. So this would be the be perhaps an answer to this. I have a question about uh, distance because what we're talking it's inside a home or an apartment. So how far you can place such sensors? And you also mentioned the firmware update. So is it speed and reliability is enough? Speed and reliability in what sense? So this radio channel will be enough uh, for doing 
update of your firmware so it's reliable and speed is enough to do it fast so it not take half a day so the um the arm uh chip is uh limited if i'm not mistaken to 16 kilobytes of uh of uh, firmware so even if you lose uh, use a pretty slow uh, connection like uh, the basic gnote one is uh, is about 50 a bit per second uh, at full rate, but I, uh, okay, you have to have packet processing, etc. So you're never going to hit that rate. Um, the range is one of the reasons we we opt for uh, the 868, and we stay out of the 2.4 because that's uh, that's terrible for your attenuation. Um, so the 868 it can travel a couple through a couple of walls and still uh, still have reasonable range. Everything depends, of course, on your radio. Uh, so what your uh, what your link budget is. So how powerful can you transmit? And what's your your your, uh, your noise floor? Um, but these newer chips, they can go up to 13 dBm of transmit power, and uh, the receiver at that rate, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, minus 105. So if you have about a link budget of 115 dBm, which should be okay for at least going through the full house. Yeah, well, depends on your house, of course. If you have a castle, that's that's, that's different. But for my house, it would be okay. So, uh, does that answer your full? Okay, for the firmware. A bit, sorry. Um, um, what we're building is um, an, um, something robust. So basically, um, the, G, the, the, the cube asks the fluxometer, do I have to upgrade during boot? And if it says yes and upgrade to this firmware, it's, it's up to the cube to collect all the packets. So if packets get lost, it will just retry until it gets its full firmware. If it if it fails, it will try again. So that's in the bootloader. Then it's the task of the bootloader to get it working again. Um, yeah, and it will try, or it will go dead failing. So uh, if you go for an upgrade and you power off the fluxometer for the next uh, for the next half a year, your battery will be dead because it will try catching up with uh, with the new firmware. There's an exponential back off in there, but uh, yeah, it's either one or the other. So yeah. Um, is it open the VRT running on the blue blue board that you you showed? Yeah, Th this this one is. It can you can you specify which system and chip you use, and how do you interface the uh, your red board with the blue board? Is it UART or something else? Yeah. Um, so yes, this is indeed open WRT. Uh, every fluxometer that has been pre-production alpha version and production has always been open WRT. Um, I, uh, I did um, the migration to attitude adjustments uh, in the second half of last year. So that, that firmware went up in, in October. Um, the connection with the, with the sensor board is via SPI. Uh, so SPI based. Um, yeah, it's bit banked SPI. Uh, but that's enough because you don't have that much uh, communication between the two. So a lot of processing is being done on the sensor board for the clamps, etc. We're sampling this at, at 600 hertz or something per. Um, or 666, so the number of the devil. Um, and then if you go to three phases, it's two kilohertz. But that's all locally on the AVR, and what you get back every second is a reading of your real-time consumption and, and a counter. Um, so that's it's by communication between the sensor board and the main one, and it's open WRT, uh, now AA, um, on, the, on the main board. Okay, two quick questions. Is there any sort of encryption between the cube device and the fluxometer? And second, is there a way is there a way to send a command to the box, or is or or it is just a node that sends it back? So for the encryption part, by default, right now we won't have encryption, but uh, in the bootloader there will already be the, the facilities to uh, download a 16-byte uh, key. Um, so there you have like a limited attack vector if, if it's in in plain um, well in, in plain uh, your 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 um, your, your um, come on your key is sent over the over the over the air so that's a limited attack vector but once it's in there it will calculate um, uh, a CRC or or a hash of the thing and once it connects again it will say okay I have this hash of of the key so it won't retransmit the key back to the pipe to the fluxometer to check it so that's only once that you have to go there. And then it's already the facility is already in the bootloader, but it's the the, the chip itself or the the radio um, will by default right now not be uh, encrypted. Um, and then the second question was, I oh yeah, have for actuation. Um, 
so the thing about actuation is that if you have to, uh, um, if you want to have it very reactive, you have to keep on your radio, which is of course a, a drain on the battery. Um, there are some um, um, uh, some intelligent ways of handling this. Uh, that's by using uh, putting your your radio to sleep and only listening every every couple of seconds for every minute. But then you have to have you have to have good synchronization. Um, but this is something that that can be done. Um, but let's say for the start, we just start with a sensor node uh, that well it senses all kinds of things and then uploads it. And uh, and especially just get this uh, the lifetime or the the battery life uh, get it as high as possible. Um, and then in the second phase, we can uh, we can look for uh, for actuation. Thank you. So um, I think are you staying for the for the uh, the session at two f at two thirty? Um, at two session at two thirty, we do have like a, a participant driven discussion. So I think if there are more people in interested into a fluxometer, I think at two thirty between two thirty and and four thirty.